All right, welcome back. Right now we have Fred Van Dyke who will be presenting on seven things that can surpri surprise you when you start customizing or developing for Plone. And as a developer, I would have to say, I don't really like surprises. So hopefully these are good surprises. And I did wanna say something about Fred Van Dyke who is with Zest and has been doing Plone for quite some time now. I wanted to point out that he's in the Netherlands' second city, isn't that right? Not yeah, Amsterdam. Right. It's, Rotter it's Rotterdam. It's 010 <laughs> and Amsterdam is 020. I, I believe there's a little bit of a rivalry between the two cities, but uh, maybe I stepped into a minefield. <laughs> All right, yes, Fred, I, please take it away. Hi, thank you, Kim. So yeah, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, very quickly. Amsterdam is our capital. Rotterdam is the second largest city with one of the biggest harbors in Europe. And as we say in Rotterdam, niet lullen maar poetsen. So that's what I'm going to do. So seven things that might surprise you when you start developing customizing Plone. My name is Fred van Dijk. I'm from Zest Software in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. We're a small Plone consultancy and we have been using Plone for a very, very long time. So you did recognize the clickbait title, right? <laughs> Everybody who wants to put a blog post somewhere online says, oh, Let's have uh, seven, eight, nine, ten things that bloody, bloody, blah, blah, blah. So what happened is was a concept proposal I sent to Chrissy early October because there were still some slots left. And I thought, okay, I've got some experience with training. I can talk half an hour for Plone, right? So that's what uh, Kim might refer to as surprises. Um, these are the surprises I have encountered myself. I have heard from others and the surprises I've seen on the faces of developers I have helped, I have trained, I have done over the years. Um, and that's uh, uh, actually the, 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 the thing I would like to discuss here. I, I, oh. uh, 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 uh. So, uh, can I hide it here? Yeah, I'll just hide it here and we'll continue. So, I am going to still try to deliver on my promise uh i did some uh, interviews here uh in sorrento i asked some people okay when you first started developing with soap with blown um what were the things that that surprised you that wondered you like huh this is completely different from any other system i know um and i also have to thank jacob thomas and stefan they're front enders at the concept we try to uh uh, uh Look, okay, how are we going to uh, improve the backend documentation? So I interviewed them yesterday, like, okay, you're front enders, you've been building stuff with Volto now for years, but now you have to start doing backend development. What are the steps that you take to modify something in Plan 6? Backend. And then I explained them, and they looked like, yeah, okay, we do this. And I explained some more. We did some kind of one and a half hour fast forward training. And then I thought, okay, yeah, that's it. That's what I can talk about tomorrow. So yeah, my apology for the bit less than optimal sketchy uh, presentation I'm going to give, but you'll get used to it. So one, the biggest surprise, if you start working with this thing we call Plone, we call SOAP underneath, everything can or could be done through the web. For me, Plone has always been in the beginning this, this dark secret black box you just run it you go to a url and then you input content and you output views uh, to other people and this is yeah it's 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 magic it's magic so why why is this magic so this is the soap vision from the 90s we just started with uh, with web components we just started with the web and some people somewhere thought about a system that we could use Python, a dynamic programming language, which was so slow, so bad, um, uh, to just create a completely dynamic application server where through the web, uh, you could just change stuff. The, the first inter interface for that was the ZMI. Um, uh, and it was a stack like Python. And then there was some old thing called Bobo, which turned into Zoop. And people thought, yeah, ZMI, cool, but Maybe we can improve some things, so we'll uh, create a content management framework. And some people saw the content management framework, which looked rather horrible. And this new cool thing came around, which was called CSS. 
okay, let's create some CSS and improve the component man the, the content management framework. And that's when Plone started. So this is a bit like, like the through the web evolution we have, and which is actually the first surprise that people have when they start tinkering and playing with Plone as an end user or as a tinkerer or as an integrator. It's so easy. It's so easy. So one done. 25 minutes and counting. So second surprise, second surprise. Oh my God, the learning curve. So you start out easy and then suddenly when you really try to do something that's not available through the front end and the easy control panels and the things that we've created with the add-ons and the other things, people climb, they climb and they fall, they fall and they climb again and they battle the learning curve. So that's the second thing that people surprise after the it's so easy, there's a learning curve. And that's because of the same stack. That's what I just told you. We have Python, we have Python on top of Python. There's the dynamic application server ZOAP from the 1994, five, six, somewhere it was started. Then there's a content management framework put on top of it, which is actually an add-on for ZOAP. And then we have an add other add-on for CMF, which is Plown again. And it's confusing. You've got a language, you've got an application server. You've got a framework, and then you've got blown the product. Blown the product. Yeah, and that's what's causing a lot of pain and trouble uh, when uh, you can start looking at this learning curve because we've got a product versus a framework. And with a product, it's just, yay, it's cool, it's finished, it's done, it's nice. And then when you consider the same product as a framework, it's, no, I'm losing my hairs, it's dynamic, it's whatever, it's file system, it's in the database, it's wherever, what, what should we do? So that's why, that's why we have this learning curve because we have a product versus a framework, we have a stack. So second part done. So third one, if you look a bit further and you try to, try to hang on and you try to, to figure out what's there, you find out that there, there are, are multiple levels of conceptual complexity in here. So you have uh, a number of drawers, so this is, something that also came into mind for me yesterday, like how, if you're going to explain people how this whole cool, nice thing that Plone is, if you wanna explain it, okay, maybe we should beforehand give people some nice drawers, explain the five levels of uh, uh, concepts we have, so that when you then start telling them people like, oh, this is PIP, this is setup tools, this is build out, this is a viewlet, this is the SOAP component architecture, this is an adapter, now we are going to adapt something. Now we're doing some uh, traversal. Then they can, if you give them maybe the concept, concepts there and they put them in the right drawers at the right time, it might help them later. Otherwise, if they come back at you, if, if they only come to you after five years of tinkering, you'll first have to undo a lot of concepts and ideas that have maybe, maybe have been put in the same drawers, in different drawers. I mean, it's the same with getting your driver's license. The worst people to teach uh, uh, to teach uh, uh, driving a car to are farmers because they've already spent like four or five or ten years driving around uh, a tractor at their own premises, and then they step into the car and they think they all know already everything, and then the instructor is, "Oh no, there we go." So many people don't, but for me, I'm a trainer, of course. I, I didn't really introduce myself, but I'm I'm a, I'm a consultant, trainer, uh, developer, tinkerer. Uh, and, and for me, this, this kind of, I thought, wait, if I explain this, then maybe it might be easier for some other people getting into Plone, getting into SOAP and getting these surprises. Let's show them some drawers. So for me, um, the, le the, the concepts I've come up with, maybe you should be changing a bit different, but you've got the package manager on the OS level. Then you've got the programming language. You've got dynamism application. Whoa, sorry, dynamism. You've got application logic and you've got a front end. And yeah. <laughs> so let's put some things in the right concepts. And this is where it gets interesting. So we've got uh, APT, RPM, package managers on the lowest level. Then you've got the programming language, Python, which has modules and you can install those modules with Python package managers pip, but you can also install Python modules with the package manager from the operating system. 
So we're on the ground two levels there. So after the programming language in Python, Python is a very cool dynamic language, but it still misses some of the dynamism that we would like to have if we are a through the web application. So that's where uh, concepts like the ZCA come from. ZCA is just something written in Python on top of Python to create it, make it more dynamic. On top of that, we get application logic, which has views, viewlets, the component registry, adapters and other things. And once we've done the logic, we'll have to get to the templates to produce something to the front end. And that's where things like so page templates, metal, Diazzo, and other things. And of course, I <laughs> lied a bit because we don't have five levels now. We have six because then you have the browser. And the dirty little secret is that in the browser inception, we have this whole same stack again nowadays because then we again have package managers, we have programming languages, we have dynamism, and we have application logic, and we show something. But let's not go there. So no wonder that this is complex, complex stuff. We have six drawers to put knowledge. And if you look at the knowledge, the, 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 the programming languages, the, the formats, uh, uh, the concepts, the ideas, the, the fixes we've created in these 10, 18 to 20 years, um, it's not easy. But now it's easy, right? So we've had a bit of an overview, what's where, so maybe if you explain this to people, if it only was so simple. Third part, done. Four, so con to continue on that, we have the same language and we have the same formats on different levels. And that's what can trip people really up because then we have this nice file with XML statements. And then we wonder, okay, what's the XML in there? It is it SOAP component architecture registration? Is it generic setup? Is it the SOAP schema? I mean, we can create SOAP schemas in XML to have it through the web. And I forgot about one, so I added later. Oh yeah, we've got a rules XML in Diazzo. Okay. And then the package manager, that's also, you have this concept, but the package manager can be done on the Python module level. It can be done in build out. PIP can also do things. We've got setup tools still there. Then we've got a package management system as a plone add-on. And then when the plone add-on is there, we still have this other concept again of a generic setup profile. That is also a kind of package management install thing. Mm -mm. But I'm here to tell you, if you're watching this and you've been confused about plone and Zoop for the last uh, few years and for studying stuff, there is no magic. Any technology that is advanced enough will be considered to be magic if you don't understand it. But if you, if you look behind the scenes, what's really there, uh, it takes time or it takes some explanation from people or it takes some looking through, uh, to, through videos on YouTube. It takes a look uh, at other things, but eventually there's no magic. So let's go, startup. So what happens? We've got a Python, 18 minutes, oh my God. We've got a Python uh, uh, interpreter that starts up. It has a syspath, and in this syspath, we inject all kinds of modules, and you can see those if you look at bin instance. Bin instance, if you run a, 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 a clone system, bin instance is just a huge big list of where Python should find all its modules. And then at the end, there are five codes that cause one of those things to start up. What it actually starts up then is the Zoop server, which then has the Zoop component architecture in there. The Zoop component architecture has one site ZCML in slash parts instance or slash zero client etc uh, site.zcml, which has a lot of package includes that point to all the different modules that are in the level above in the Python modules. And it will then start looking for a configure ZCML in all those Python modules. This registers all the components and all the other nice things. And then when we've started, we've got a runtime environment. We've got a Python process running there and it has all kinds of things registered. And there are all kinds of objects in there which have a certain class, which is on the, on the Python programming level. And that's actually the whole big ZODB tree. And then if you wonder what generic setup is, okay, here it comes. ZCML is, as you can see on the second part loaded when we boot up the Python interpreter. But if you have a ZODB with things running in memory, then generic setup is just some XML that you can use to apply or change some things in that ZODB tree. And that's the difference between ZCML and XML. 
and of course, before you all have this, um, it would be a really bothersome thing to write down all these bin instances and these side set CMLs and all these other things. So that's what we have scaffolding for, it's actually level zero that creates all the things for you to have this running. And then we're done. Then we start up. There's a clone service running. So ZCA is for the dynamism. It's on top of Python. It's built in Python with some XML files and it swaps out components or it overrides components in the runtime when it starts up. Why do we do this? Because the alternative is just editing all the, all the core Python files and then going into version hell to, or you have to just copy uh, your modifications to all your colleagues twice an hour um, for the rest of the, I, I heard we, we, we had a, we had some, some guy working for us for a while and said, but how do you do this with version management? We just have a folder for the client project and we just copy them around all the time if we modify something. Okay, yeah, that's cool. You can do that. Second part, what you can do is version management. We've got the subcomponent architecture by which we can swap out Python files, swap out, out not Python files, but which by we can override classes, methods, and other things in the file itself. Why? Well, otherwise, alternatives would also be you could just compile and restart all the time. But that's not what the subcomponent architecture will offer you. So, we're done. We've got a clone, uh, uh, a clone process running, which is actually a Python process. There are a lot of things in memory, all kinds of runtime objects and classes. And this is the SOAP application server running. We're there. Well, we're not there yet. <laughs> so SOAP is not that complicated, right? It's not that complicated. We've got an HTTP request coming in and that we create a request object. We do some nice traversal over the URL. And with this nice thing called traversal, we find the object somewhere in the SOAP runtime tree with all the objects. And actually SOAP is not that complicated because SOAP is this thing in the middle that uh, has some persistence and stores all those objects automatically without you, know it, without you knowing it on the file system or in the SQL database. Whenever it starts to run out of memory, it quickly swaps out those things to disk, or if they're not longer there, it loads them again. And if you change any object, you edit or you change an attribute or you do something else, it stores it also uh, to disk as persistence. So we've got our object, which is persistent, but still in memory. So both dynamic and on file system. We have an object, which is the context, what we call the context. And then we process the request with the context. And that could be a view, that could be an edit method. And then we profit, we're done. And that's, that's how SOAP works. Any questions? Am I going too fast? Okay, so that was that. <clears throat> Sorry, I <clears throat> forgot something. So um, we've got a request and we've got a context and the SOAP component, component architecture does some kind of component lookup on this combination that has two interfaces and we are going to find a view and a controller code class with some code there that's going to actually process this context and this request. And then we've got a template, which is connected. So that's the model view controller thingy here that we have in some uh, uh, same similar way here. And we're going to render that template. So the template gets some HTML. Oh, but wait, it's a main template. So we're going to insert some more uh, metal and other macros. And oh, maybe we're navigating to another object in the SOAP database. So then with the nice little yellow dots, we go back to another request context and we start a recursive one and maybe there are also some other sub requests we need to do so at that stage we can still call uh, uh, again do some loops and recursively resolve all the lookups we have so we've got some html then we run it through the portal transforms which is a separate system to for example uh, uh, modify little things in in the html in all kinds of ways like adding uh, uh, subheadings to images or uh, changing uh, 
uh, changing the encoding or doing whatever, and we've got HTML, and then we're done. Unless you work in uh, Clone 5, because then we've added Diazzo in front of it. Diazzo is a nice uh, system to have a theme with some rules that can replace and pick everything from the already generated HTML, which is called the content. And you can pick and choose all kinds of elements in this HTML and insert them into the theme. And then we deliver the theme and we're done. So, and these are still lies to children. I learned this uh, lies to children concept uh, uh, from uh, some very cool books that uh, Terry Pratchett did with, together with scientists, which is called The Science of This World. And in one of those books, we explain that everything we learn on our learning path is still lies to children. For example, when you're young, there's in the magical books, there's earth, wind, fire, and water. These are the elements. And then you go to primary school, secondary school, and you learn about molecules. Then no, molecules are atoms, actually. And then we've got the electrons and the other tiny parts there. And then when you get to university, we get to quarks. And when it gets really, really strange, we come up with snare theory, we come up with relativity and other. So yeah, it's, it's all, it still lies to children. And I, I must say it's difficult to, uh, it, it's difficult on one hand to deal with it. On the other hand, it's the only way how we learn. And yeah, you could explain this. Or you can just say, go through this folder, create some files and create a view and then it works. But I hope maybe some people will help this little chart. So I did this at the 2015 Mastering Clone Training uh, when some people we were had just have explained how the, the traversal and the request context did. And I was, people were, were staring and I was like, oh, Philip, uh, can I show you this thing for five minutes? So I showed the, this thing and Philip Bauer was like, no, what did you do? So, one third of the people were suddenly like, aha. One third of the people was like, uh, toilet break. And one third of the people was like, no, overload. But still, it, it, it might avoid uh, uh, deus ex machinas because that's what you normally also have to do first with these lies to children. You have to say, look, there's some things you don't know yet, but you will learn about them later. So. If you think this is too much, then maybe you'll have to come back a little later, or maybe if it now snaps to you and it, it makes sense to you, um, that's cool as well. So that's five. SOAP is very complicated, but it's there's no magic. So six, acquisition. That was also a nice surprise for people. It's traversal in the wrong direction. Um, then if you want to learn about traversal, uh, check out the 2019 talk uh, by Eric Breho called Traversal, this thing so difficult to explain, but which is so simple. Um, acquisition is just the thing that the Zoe people came up with in 1995 to have some inheritance and don't repeat yourself uh, in the first versions of the application server. And it has been with us ever since. Nobody expects. Yes, this was just one slide on acquisition. <laughs> just one, yes, no, one slide. I don't want to talk about it. So seven. Whenever you try to explain things, you improve your own understanding. I don't know if other people, but that was my surprise when I started. Uh, 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 becoming part of, of the clone community, uh, learning about clone, learning out about SOAP, first doing some development and then trying to explain things to other people. And I was like, ah, okay, but hey, if I try to explain it to you, if I try to come up with an analogy, uh, it's often the wrong analogy and you overload people and they get a brain freeze. But if you get a bit better at it, then explaining things in different ways does help most people. And there's so much blown content online. And that's also something I didn't really know and what surprised me. There's trainings, there's talks, there's YouTube with a lot of videos like this recording, like recordings from so many past phone conferences. There's World Plone Day videos. There's so much material there. There's GitHub. If you want to learn Plone, go to GitHub, check about which other companies are doing something. Git Concept, EEA, Cest, Red Turtle, Redomino, Six Feet Up, Netsite, you name them, Emeo, 
I, I could continue for, for, for half an hour just mentioning companies that have a GitHub repo where you can see add-ons, where you can see build-outs, where you can see new pip installs. There's the Plone, to, not to mention there's Plone, there's Collective, which has, is our main repo of code, where you can just look in. It's open source. You can see what's happening there. You can learn. So we all learn on different ways. We have our own preferences. I have to say to my shame that, that only last week I, I realized that I'm not that much of a fan of a video guy. But there's so much videos to see. For, for me personally, videos are always too slow. I just like them to, to see them and, and learn them in my own tempo. And then I have to wait in a video until somebody makes a point, maybe like I'm doing myself now. But there's so much information in there. There's so much information. And if you have different viewpoints and different angles to, to learn it from other people from different uh, ways, I mean, we did this uh, yesterday. It started out as a joke, but I think it really was fun to have both Philip and me talking about export import straight after each other, but doing in a different way. And then we got some really nice feedback also from people in the Yitzi like, yeah, but Philip did this, this was, hey, you did this, and hey, this is cool. Yeah, and finally, the biggest surprise when you start out as a developer, the community is really our biggest asset because those people are generating all these different views and all these different concepts and are, are helping you with trainings every year. And they want to help you to succeed. So thank you. Um, I had, uh, so, um, somebody said to me, oh, look, you're drawing. Uh, oh, that's, that was, a, oh yeah, of course. That was a theme on a, a video talk on PlonConf 2020, sketching for the workplace. I actually got the motivation for trying to practice uh, drawing by pen from a book I already bought like 10 or 15 years ago, The Back of the Napkin from Dan Rome. Um, yeah, it's fun. Thank you. I hope this might have helped you a bit if you uh, are serious about the whole request context cycle or the concepts uh, very slowly play back this presentation. Fred, thank you very much. Thank Bravo. you. <laughs> Those uh, slides of yours, those hand-drawn slides of yours are wonderful. Uh, or that's a great font that you used. <laughs> yeah, that's my handwriting. <laughs> so oh, I should mention one, one last thing, Kim. So Volto is not in here. I'm just learning Volto, but we, we, I, we could do the same for Volto. But this, this is still classic clone. Uh, but as I said, there's inception there in the front end. You can have this whole stack also again. And maybe, may, maybe no promises. I'll do this next year or the year afterwards. Thank you, Fred. All right. So for you viewers who are watching now in Loudswarm, please join Fred and me in the Jitsi. That's that blue button underneath the video frame here. And uh, I've really appreciated your, your trying to outline all the complexity and really the best asset of Plone, which is the wonderful community. Thank you very much, Fred. You're welcome.